Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, before we get back to crossing the reality gap, I usually don't call on any of you specifically because I don't like to embarrass you, but I'm gonna make an exception this morning. Uh, Piper Welch, uh, my PhD student and a fellow student of yours here uh, in this class, just heard yesterday that she received the very prestigious NSF uh, Graduate Research Fellowship. The NSF, or the National Science Foundation, is the flagship, flagship organization in the US for funding all basic science uh, and engineering research. Um, every year, they call for applications for these GRFs, Graduate Research uh, Fellowships. They're very competitive. Uh, it's a 15% acceptance rate. Out of every 100 applications, only 15 are actually funded. And this is the National Science Foundation's way of uh, nodding towards and helping those they think are gonna be the next rising stars in science and engineering. So please join me in congratulating Piper on winning one. Well done, Piper. Okay, about, about robots that we are gonna talk about at the very end of this class. Exactly, thank you. Okay, so back to uh, evolutionary robotics. Uh, we are working our way through some of the open challenges uh, in the field, and we are partway through our discussion of arguably the biggest open question in the field. How do we ensure that things evolved in simulation when we build them in reality are gonna hold on to those evolved forms uh, and functions. Uh, graduate students, you're carrying on with your milestones. Undergraduates, you're starting to think about and hopefully have already chosen what you want to do for your final project. You're going to tell us uh, next Monday, you're going to tell us next Monday how you've broken that, uh, uh, that project down into three weekly deliverables and demonstrate that you've implemented the first of those three uh, deliverables. Any questions about final project, milestones? Uh, one thing that I noticed, um, and I should have mentioned earlier, is screenshots of code doesn't count. Wasn't asked for during the 10 assignments, also doesn't count. If you, if you submitted uh, code, we'll give you a pass this week. Um, but please, what we're, we can't debug your code by looking at the screenshot. Um, if your code isn't yet running or you don't have your simulation up and running, you can print stuff to the console, something demonstrating to us that your code is doing what you expect it to do. Yeah? Screenshots of code, not sufficient. All good? Reasonable? Okay. All right. So uh, we started last time by looking at the very first attempt to cross the sim to real gap, which has this very fancy name, the radical envelope of noise hypothesis. We'll talk about what exactly that means. Um, everything in AI that's old is new again. NVIDIA thought they came up with this brand new idea back in 2018. They were just rediscovering something that Jacobi published on in 97, which is this radical envelope of noise hypothesis. Basically speaking, it's something that's hopefully very intuitive to all of you by now. One way to ensure that robots evolved in simulation will transfer to reality is to noisify different parts of the simulation. Because if you don't, the evolutionary algorithm might find ways to evolve neural controllers or, and or the physical structure of your simulated robot to exploit aspects of the simulation. Perhaps the friction coefficient in your simulated floor is relatively low, so it's almost like the robot is on a virtual icy surface and it might evolve to skate or push itself and slide along the ground. If you then build that physical robot and put it on something other than ice, it's not gonna work. You're gonna fail to cross the sim to real gap, right? Friction coefficients of the ground, that is one of many, many, many different parameters in a physics engine that might be a target for exploration by an evolutionary algorithm. So let's try and poison that feature by noisifying it. Every time it's simulated in, the, in a simulator, it's always a little different. Okay, the problem is what do you noisify and how much the more complicated the simulator you have, the more things there are you need to noisify. So in this very first attempt, Jacobi created a minimal simulation, something that was as simple as possible. Uh, so there was few things for the evolutionary algorithm to exploit as possible. And we'll, uh, we'll come back to his minimal simulation in a few slides. So the way that Jacobi uh, approached this problem was to look at all the parameters in a physics engine. 
friction coefficients, uh, the masses and mass distribution of the robot, the strength of the motors, the speed of the motors, the ranges of the rotational joints, and decide, does that particular feature have a basis in reality? For example, the friction coefficient of the floor, it does have a basis in reality. There is a friction coefficient for in simulation. Carpet has a particular friction coefficient. This tabletop has a particular friction coefficient. So there's a correspondence. Now the value of that particular parameter, the friction coefficient of the floor, might be different between simulation and reality. We might not know what the friction coefficient is going to be in the robot's real world environment. So we'll noisify a little bit the uh, friction coefficient of the simulated ground. So that would be put into this base set. The simulation aspects that do have a basis in reality, but are probably or most likely going to be different somehow in reality. There is another set, which is the implementation set of interactions. These are simulation aspects that exist in the virtual world that have no basis in reality. They, have, they, will, they will not transfer, they don't even exist in reality. Can anybody think about what these might be? Like the coefficient of the, the force supply when two objects overlap? Absolutely, right? So when two objects in slightly interpenetrate in a physics engine, there's a small force that pushes them apart that doesn't exist in reality. Now, when two objects collide in reality, they do supply a force to one another, uh, and, and they do bounce apart in some way. So that's a good point. This, this idea of the forces that result from interpenetration during collision detection resolution, I would probably put that in the implementation set as well. It's a little bit of, of subjectivity here. What are some other sort of dangerous things, some artifacts of simulation that probably don't exist in reality? Other ideas? It's sort of based in reality, but like the implementation is pretty different, where you have like a time step where things are like updating in like fixed periods of time. Absolutely, right? So in a simulator, time, uh, time is discrete, right? There are these discontinuous jumps from one moment in time to the next. As far as we know in, this, in the physical universe, it's not like that. Yeah, or at least not at our size scale. Time is continuous, absolutely. Does the evolutionary algorithm exploit that fact? It could if you have like something that goes really fast. You could have like tunneling where like you can't like detect the collision. You can do like half the object. Absolutely. So uh, you can try this in the physics engine. You can shoot two spheres at one another, and if they're large enough, they will hit and bounce apart. But if they're smaller, 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 and they're being their positions are being updated in a discrete manner, you can actually get tunneling. You can get them to actually pass by one another and the collision detector will miss that there was a collision at some point between these discrete points in time. Yeah, great, that's a great example. Okay, so we're gonna see in this simple experiment what they put in the base set and the implementation set in a moment. Here's the simulated robot they used, should look pretty familiar. This is the Kepra hockey puck type uh, robot. We've got two, uh, two wheels, left wheel, right wheel. Uh, as usual, we have eight infrared sensors, six on the front of the robot's body, two on the back of the robot's body, and two ambient sensors here. These are uh, ambient light sensors. They pick up the ambient light falling on the sensor. You might recall when we first talked about the Kepra, this is actually how the physical Kepra is put together because they're gonna try and cross the sim to real gap here. They're gonna evolve neural controllers for this simulated robot, take the best, uh, the most fit evolved controller, take it out of the simulated Kepra and put it in the physical Kepra, cross our fingers and see whether it's able to retain the evolved behavior. Okay, here's the task. This is the T-Maze. Anybody seen this task before? If you've ever taken a psych class or a couple of psych classes, you put a rat in the base of the tea maze and the rat is moving around in the tunnel and if the rat gets halfway up the base of the tea maze, a light will randomly flash from either the left side or the right side. 
And if the rat continues moving up into the junction of the T maze and turns in the direction in which it saw the light, the light is flashed temporarily. So by the time the rat gets to the junction in the T maze, it can't see the light anymore. But if it remembers on which side it saw the light and turns in that direction, it will find that there's a delicious slice of cheese waiting for it on the correct side. It gets a food reward if it turns in the same direction in which it saw the light. You take the rat, you put it back down into the base of the tea maze, and you reset the experiment. You do this over and over again. What do you think happens? Tell me about the rat's behavior as this experiment unfolds. You repeat this process over and over again. <coughs> It becomes a habit in what sense? How do you know it's become a habit for the rabbit? Uh, for the for the rabbit, habit for the rat. Well, if you if you're having the light go from the same place every time and you stop using the light, then um, it'll just go to where the light used to be. Ah, okay. Sorry, I I I, should, I maybe didn't fill in all the details. Every time you put the rat back in the base of the tea maze, the next time it gets to the midpoint, the light will flash randomly from the left or the right side. So the light always flashes, but from what side you don't know. If it flashes on the left. The cheese is waiting in the top left part of the tea maze. If the light flashes on the right, the cheese is waiting at the top right of the, of the tea maze. What happens over time? It figures out that the side with the light has the cheese. Absolutely. It learns that, to associate the light as the signal for where the cheese will be. And at the beginning of the experiment, the rat doesn't know this. It'll turn random directions 50-50. But as the experiment goes on, it will preferentially turn in the direction in which it saw the light. The rat is learning to remember or learning to associate the light with uh, which way it turns in the tea maze. Very famous experiment in psychology. Now we replace, uh, now we replace the rat with a Kepper robot. It's got its infrared sensors, which remember are proximity sensors, so it can move about in this tunnel. And it's got its two ambient light sensors. So at a certain point in time, there is suddenly much more stimulation on the right light ambient sensor than the left, or vice versa. Then suddenly, that momentary stimulation of light is gone. And when the Kepera, if the Kepera gets up here, it has to turn in the direction of the light. Yeah. This T maze uh, experiment is designed to train rats, or in this case, Kepera robots, to remember which side did I see the light on and to turn in that direction. Right? So, T maze has been used for many, many decades, probably a century at this point, as a test for memory. Among other things, a test for memory. Can, can the rat or whatever species we put into its equivalent of the tea maze, can it learn to remember this piece of information? It's obvious, right? You have, to, you have to remember in order to solve this task because the light is temporary. The light is not on by the time you get to the junction. It's obvious that this task selects for memory. Okay, you're still all nodding. You don't know me well enough yet. Thinking about thinking is misleading. I feel like we need to kind of cheat it. You can cheat? How? Like, because we have the, the light sensors, like the ambient light sensors, and like the two sides of the robot. If you basically coded it to try to go towards the light, and then also hug walls, you could essentially, as soon as the light flashed, if you were placed in the middle of the, the corridor, as soon as the lights flash, nudge yourself towards the light, and then basically stick to the wall, and then you hug that corner. Absolutely, absolutely. So it turns out if you try this, and you can try this in uh, in your code base now relatively easily by building a few walls and, and flashing uh, some lights, you don't need to remember, right? It seems obvious that somewhere in the rat's brain or in the Kepera's neural controller, it should store and hold on to one bit, at least one bit of information, was the light on the left or the right. The memory has to be in the brain in order to solve this task. It doesn't have to be that way. Embodied cognition suggests there is another way to solve the task. As you mentioned, it could, the moment it sees the light, turn towards the light. 
It could evolve a neural controller a bit like a uh, Bradenburg vehicle, the, the, the lover of light, turn towards the light, which will bring you towards the wall from which the light flashed, hug the wall, and then when you get to the junction, turn towards the wall that's closest to you. You don't necessarily need to remember. Alternatively, you could argue that it's, it's not cheating, it's just the robot storing the memory outside its neural controller. Where is the memory now? It's its position. It's its position, or its position relative to the wall, or its particular relationship to the environment. If you think about it, you know, humans do this all the time. I mean, I've got a very long to-do note where I've written everything down. I don't remember. The memories are in my to-do list. But it's not an obvious way to think about memory. When we talk about memory, it seems like it's something inside the brain, right? Not necessarily. Another example of thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay. However, tangential to this particular experiment. Okay, regardless of whether the Kepler remembers or not, we're going to evolve it to try and solve the TMA's task. We're going to evolve a population of neural controllers. We're going to drop each neural controller into the simulated Kepler multiple times, put it at the base of the TMA's, and if it gets this far, flash the light randomly from the left or the right. And the fitness of that neural controller, averaged over multiple trials, is D1. How far, on average, does it travel up the stem of the T? And if it gets all the way up uh, to the stem of the T uh, and turns in either direction, either toward in the right direction or the wrong direction, however far it travels within the top of the T, that's D2, and we're going to reward that as well. If it happens to have turned in the correct direction of the lights, it gets an extra 100 points. Why didn't we just create a fitness function where it gets 100 if it goes up and turns in the right direction, and zero if it doesn't? We'll never figure out how to actually get all the way up to the It probably won't figure out how to do that, right? Very difficult. You imagine a fitness landscape where most of the fitness landscape is flat and low. Most neural controllers will get a fitness of zero. And somewhere in that landscape is a huge vertical spike, which represents one or a few neural controllers that cause the robot to drive in the right direction and turn, uh, drive in the right direction, drive up the stem and turn in the right direction. Yeah? That kind of fitness landscape, all flat and off in the distance somewhere is a very spiky uh, tower. If you cover that entire landscape in dense fog and you're on the flat, where do you go? You have no idea how to make any progress, right? So it makes sense to throw in D1 and D2 that now make the fitness landscape have lots of slopes and hills and valleys and so on that hopefully will eventually lead the robot to this. What do we, what do we call these D1 and D2 terms? What is it that we're doing for the robot? to the robot or for the robot. We're kind of helping it or helping the evolutionary algorithm. Where did we hear this idea before? Scaffolding. This is scaffolding, right? Helping the learner or the evolver in this case, sort of giving it a hint or at least giving it a slope along which it can start to master this task. Yeah. OK, um, this experiment was carried out in 1997, three years before physics engines were invented. So they created a very simple, minimal simulation. There was really no physics here. Um, they simulated kind of a virtual tunnel uh, for phase one, and they sort of just measured how far along this tunnel the robot moved. There was a little bit of collision detection and resolution, but it wasn't, it was very, very simplified. Um, and they would measure how far up the robot moved in this virtual tunnel, and that was D1. If the robot managed to get all the way up the base of the T, the robot would be teleported out of the base and into the junction, into this part of the T maze. And then they would measure D2, how far it moved to the right or how far it moved to the left in this second tunnel. Seems kind of odd. Why are they teleporting it when it gets close to the junction? 
pick one of these multiple positions where you can't externalize my memory? Uh, good guess. Uh, they might have done this to try and guard against uh, cheating, like hugging a wall. That wasn't the reason. Any other ideas? It is also easier to simulate. It's easier to simulate, yeah. Not quite the reason, the specific reason why they did it. Can we be a little bit more specific? Remember that they're, good, they're evolving these controllers. They're eventually going to try and take one and put it in a physical Kepra with physical wheels, physical light sensors, physical infrared sensors. Somebody asked, actually, when we were first introduced infrared sensors, which send out a beam of infrared light, and how it bounces back tells the robot how far away the object was that the beam, hit, the infrared beam hit and reflected back. Yeah? Makes sense if you're facing the wall head on. The time it takes for the reflected beam to come back, great. If I hit side on, depending on the surface here, it can scatter the light, a little difficult. If there's a more complex object that the light hits, and I get some of the, that light back at, at some time in the future, what does that mean about how far away the object is? Imagine the Kepra sitting somewhere here in the junction, and its infrared sensors, its eight of them are sending out eight infrared beams and getting back some or none of the reflected light. In this complicated environment in here, this is part, going to become part of the implementation set. How the infrared sensors behave when the robot is near or in the junction is going to have no basis in reality. So they place this noise zone back here. When they teleport the robot here, if uh, the two backward-facing infrared sensors send out beams into this noise zone, or this robot turns and some of the six forward-facing infrared sensors send out beams into this noise zone, those sensors get back maximum noise. They get back a random number in the range of whatever these simulated infrared sensors deal with. Yeah? You do not want evolution to exploit sensory information in the, the junction at all. OK. Let's have a look briefly at this minimal simulation I mentioned at the end of last class. It's basically a spreadsheet or a lookup table. Uh, they made two different lookup tables. In one of the lookup tables, you take the robot's current orientation. Uh, the robot's current orientation, you look for that orientation in the lookup table. The lookup table gives you back delta x and delta y, how the robot, the new, how you should change the x and y position of the robot. Doesn't get much simpler than that. How do you simulate? The second lookup table is for the infrared sensors. Given the robot's orientation and distance away from a wall, those two values are used to find an entry in the second lookup table. And the third value that's returned is how long is the line segment from the infrared sensor to the wall. And that length is the value they feed into the uh, simulated infrared sensor. Very, very simple. There's really no physics. There's no virtual world here at all. This is the most minimal simulation we're going to see in this class. Yeah? OK. OK. So let's talk about the base set first. We just mentioned the implementation set. What are some things that are going to have some basis in reality that evolution needs to learn how to get the robot to exploit or use? How the robot moves in response to its motor signals, that's important. That's lookup table one here. If the, if the simulated wheels or if the two motor neurons are outputting non-zero values, you need to move the robot. You might put a little bit of noise on that. If the, le if the right wheel is spinning faster, meaning the robot needs to turn to the left, you might turn the robot a little bit more or a little bit less to the left. How the infrared sensors respond, so when you get values back from the sensor lookup table, you sprinkle a little bit of noise on the numbers being returned. Same thing with the ambient sensors. When the virtual, when the, when the virtual light flashes, 
The amount of light that falls on the two ambient sensors, you might noisify that a little bit as well. Yeah? There's lots of other things they could have added some noise to, but not that many more things because there aren't that many things in the simulator to begin with. Yeah? Okay. As I already mentioned now, the implementation set, there's one parameter in the implementation set, which is how the infrared sensors behave when the robot is at or near the T-junction. So if it's in the junction, all it, basically all, any of its sensors that are uh, facing the noise zone go completely haywire. Those random, completely random numbers are being fed into the neural network. So the neural network is going to have to evolve the ability to deal with that complete noise somehow. It seems like this is quite, going to be quite a challenge for the evolutionary algorithm. How can a neural network possibly deal with this? How can it reliably turn in the right direction, whatever the right direction is, in this particular trial, at the same time that one or more of its infrared sensors is receiving complete noise. We wouldn't be here talking about this experiment if it didn't work, so there's got to be a way. Then you, if you build the neural network in a certain way that lets you like tell when something's rapidly changing between different values, then you would be able to just like notice that that's happening and just ignore, like go into noise mode and ignore that? Go into noise mode or ignore it somehow, right? Try, try and ignore it as best you can and pay attention to the other sensors that have low standard deviation in their values, right? How do we do this? Or how does the evolution do this? With inhibitory connections. Here's one of the evolved neural networks. The solid lines are excitatory synapses, and the dashed lines are inhibitory connections. Remember, inhibitory sensors mean that the stronger their presynaptic neuron is firing, the more they suppress the value they supply to their postsynaptic neuron. Right? That's an inhibitory connection. I think I mentioned in this course earlier, in human nervous systems, most of the connections in your brain are actually inhibitory, which is a good thing. Okay. I will come back to the neural controller in a moment. Okay. Uh, here's, the, the, they mentioned this as implementation details. I, impl they mentioned implementation set as the set of parameters in which they add 100% noise. So this was a little unclear in the paper. I, th I think what they meant is these are additional base set details. These are things they added a little bit of noise to in addition to these three uh, parameters in the base set. They varied, a well, they varied the side from which the light comes. This is 50-50. The light either flashes on the left or right for every trial. Every time the robot was placed into this virtual T-maze, the width of the corridor was also changed a little bit between 13 and 23 centimeters. These actual values, you don't need to write them down. They're not really relevant to us. But as you can see here, they're varying not just the robot and its internal behavior, but the external environment as well. When they place the robot at the bottom of the base of the T, they put it at a starting random orientation. The length of the light zone. So the way this is usually done in reality is you cut a hole in the side of the base of the T maze, and you make a little shutter, a little slider. Same thing in the, in the virtual T maze and the physical T maze. The length, uh, the length of that slider when you open it up to flash the light uh, varied between two and 12 centimeters. So the way in which the ambient sensors are detecting light is also gonna vary quite a bit. The length of the corridors, they vary that. So basically, evolution is evolving neural networks Evolving neural networks against a moving target. The Keppra never enters the same T maze twice. Yeah? It's always changing. And we're selecting for the robot's average behavior over multiple trials. Okay. So again, here's, here's an evolved uh, controller. They imposed bilateral symmetry 
You may remember when we talked about the first experiments in evolutionary robotics, the investigators often put in some, they fixed some things that they thought were important, like bilateral symmetry. They were right, they're still right. That's a pretty important thing to have. But they let, uh, they let evolution evolve the weights of the synapses. The weights could be positive, excitatory, or negative, inhibitory. They also evolved the activation thresholds. You remember one of the activation functions that's possible is the step function. If the weighted sum coming into the neuron is below the threshold, the neuron outputs a maximum negative value. If the weighted sum coming into a neuron at any given period of time, at any point in time, is above the threshold, you output a max, the neuron outputs a maximum positive value. Here's an example of one evolved controller. Did it evolve to cheat? Did it evolve to hug the wall? Or did it evolve to remember where the light is? And if it did, if it evolved to remember, where is the memory of the light being stored in this neural controller? This is the one time in this class where it's not a trick question. This particular, in this, at least in this evolutionary run, it did not evolve to cheat. It did evolve to remember where the light is. And there is one part of this network where it's remembering. Idea? Can this be um, the, the one in the four of the point six one? Ah, uh, good question. Um, actually, it might be. The, the memory might actually be stored multiple times in multiple places, or parts of the memory might be stored in different places. So that's a good guess. As we talked about before, recurrent connections and self-connections, like you see here, are repositories of memory. So it could be. You'll notice that the self-connections are on uh, infrared 1 and infrared 4. It could also be remembering past values of IR1 and IR4. It's not quite clear but it could also be mixing those values with memory of the light. Good, good guess. The demo move between the motor, uh, the adjacent ambient sensor, and one of the front two IR sensors? Uh, between the ambient and one of the front two. So we go yeah, here, we go could be, and then we go here, and then we go here. There's a little bit of a loop here as well, so possibly. There, you can trace, there's several places where there are recurrent loops in this network, so that's also a possibility. There is, however, there is a stronger candidate here. Let's have a look at this interesting loop here that goes from the left ambient sensor over here with an inhibitory connection, and you have a, the, value, the synapse emanating from the right ambient sensor is connecting to the left ambient sensor with a negative value. They're mutual, it, this is mutual inhibition. We have two neurons which are mutually, mutual inhibition. They are mutually inhibiting one another. What does that mean? Or what happens? Any ideas? creates kind of like a flip-flopping logic because it, the only thing that's going to change their state is an outside force. Absolutely. It creates a flip, flip it basically creates a flip-flop or a switch, right? When both of them have more or less the same values, if the robot is traveling up from the base, the bottom of the base of the T maze in relative darkness, both ambient sensors are firing with about the same value and they're both trying to push each other down with the same force which means they're both failing, right? There's a bit of a tug of war, nobody's winning. Suddenly the light flashes from the right and suddenly the values of the uh, right hand ambient sensor is stronger than the value of the left ambient sensor. What happens in that moment in time? What's happening between these two neurons? One suddenly has a higher value than the other. It's pushing the other one down with more force, right? It's a weighted sum. 
So now one of them has become stronger and it starts to push down on the other one. The other one's value starts to drop. What happens, uh, what happens, how does the left uh, neuron now inhibit the right neuron? Less, right? Inhibit, inhibition of the right sensor is dropping. So the right hand sensor, the right hand neuron, sensor neuron is getting stronger. There's less inhibition on it. To the point where when the right hand light switches off and the excitation of the sensor, the value that's pushing this neuron up, this neuron is so strong now, it doesn't need the light anymore. It stays up and it keeps pushing the other one down meaning the other one fails to inhibit this neuron, right? And we now have stored a memory of where the light is, right? It basically, mutual inhibition uh, exaggerates and then imprints something that happened in the past in a neural circuit. Not just a single neuron, you need two, at least two neurons for this to happen. Now that you've seen this mutual inhibition circuit, there are many other mutual inhibition circuits in this neural network. Mutual inhibition is also one of the most common motifs seen in biological nervous systems. Yeah. It is a great way to store information. Okay. All right, again, this paper is uh, at least 25, 27 years old at this point. So no YouTube videos. We're gonna have to make do with uh, screenshots here. This might be difficult to see. There we go. Okay, so they took this evolved controller and dropped it into the physical hockey puck type uh, robot and evaluated it many times in many di six different kinds of T mazes. They put a little uh, LED on top of the robot uh, so that the LED was not flashing on the ambient sensors, very important, and just recorded that light trace over time. Here you can see the robot starting uh, here, moving up the base of the T maze. The light is flashing on the left and the robot turns to the left when it gets to the junction. They put it back in the base of the T-maze, let it go again, again, flash the light from the left, and they did this multiple times, so there are actually multiple light trails in this image, and every time the robot did the right thing. Yeah, Same maze, same controller, same robot, do it again a bunch of times with light uh, temporarily flashing from the right, and again, the robot does the right thing. So it didn't just evolve to always turn left. Yeah. So this was the very first demonstration of crossing the reality gap, evolving something in simulation, evolving behavior in simulation, and transferring it to reality. What did they change in experiment three and four here? Still same evolved controller. What's different? It's a wider corridor, right? So now they're changing the environment. Uh, and, you, and they also placed the Kepra at slightly different positions and orientations at the bottom of the base of the T-maze. You can see these light trails start from different positions and head in different directions. It still reliably does the right thing. They widened the corridor again, tried with some different starting orientations of the Kepra they not only evolved and transferred behavior from simulation to reality, they evolved robust behavior and retained that robustness in reality. Yeah. An admittedly simple experiment, but a non-trivial thing to do. Yeah. They were successful here for many reasons. One of them was because the robot was so simple, uh, the robot was so simple and the environment was so simple. Now we're gonna to start to see some robots as we move forward in time that are not so minimal, uh, are not so simple in environments that are not so simple and crossing the reality gap becomes much, much more difficult because we're dealing with more complicated robots in more complicated simulation, simulated environments and the chance of crossing the gap is lower. So they solved it in the simple case back in 1997 but the more complex cases unsolved to this day, still very difficult.
Okay, so we're traveling chrono chronologically through attempts to cross the reality gap. We looked at the noise hypothesis from 1997. Let's jump forward three years to uh, the year 2000. Um, this is uh, one of the few times that robots made it onto the front page of the New York Times. Uh, this was the Golem project that was uh, published in Nature uh, at that time. And at least according to the New York Times, what was so amazing about this experiment was not that they crossed the reality gap. Now that's not gonna be something that makes sense to the general public. It's that it's a robot that made its own robots. Why, why that title? I haven't obviously shown you what the Golem Project is yet, but you can see the physical robots here that were, that were built for crossing the reality gap in this experiment. What is it that you think the reporter is referring to here? It doesn't really have to do with the Cinderella gap. It's something else about this experiment that caught their attention. Can you, there's some hints given the structure of the physical robot itself. I realize this is now a historical experiment, 23 years old. At the time, there was something jaw-dropping about this experiment, aside from the fact that it crossed the sin to real gap. No? They evolved robots in simulation, which were, and physics engines had just been released this year, so this is one of the first attempts to use a physics engine for something other than a video game. And then when they went to transfer the robot from simulation to reality, they were not pulling an evolved controller out of a simulated robot and dropping it into a physical robot. The evolutionary algorithm that you're gonna see in a moment was evolving the brain and the body of the robot itself. This body doesn't really look like something a human would make. It's bilaterally symmetric, which is good. In this case, the evolutionary algorithm designed the body and the brain which meant they couldn't drop the controller into a Kepra or a dog robot because it's evolution coming up with the body. They had to make the body. How did they make the body? They needed to manufacture the evolved body. What do you think they used to do that? No? They didn't make the body, they printed the body using this brand new technology that no one had seen before called a 3D printer. All of the white stuff that you see here, this is thermoplastic. This is plastic that has a high melting point. We'll see in a moment they used a brand new 3D printer that like an inkjet printer, instead of spitting out ink, it would warm up and spit out liquid plastic that would hit a plate or it would hit the printing, the robot being printed, and that liquid uh, plastic would very quickly solidify, and they built up the shape, and then plugged in the sensors and motors of the robot, and off you go. Yeah? Okay. All right, so part of the, part of the inspiration for this project, uh, there were several points of inspiration, obviously crossing the sim to real gap, 3D printers, but also trying to take a step towards this vision of self-replicating machines. So you could actually argue that a 3D printer is a robot. So maybe the, the reporter wasn't off by that much. We have a 3D printer making, or a robot making another robot. This is an idea that's been around uh, since the 1980s. NASA was very interested in this idea, still is. Um, the idea actually goes back even further to 1948. Uh, John von Neumann, one of the pioneers of the computer age, among other things, had this thought experiment about imagine someday we can make machines that make machines. Yeah. Okay. Um, we were going to talk about self-replication in this class, but we're a little bit behind where I wanted us to be. So I've made a new section at the bottom of the schedule called lectures we didn't have time for. And we would have had a lecture on self-replication. I don't think we're going to have time for it. I'll put up a link to the slide deck for those of you that are interested in self-replicating robots. Who's not interested in self-replicating robots? Okay. All right. But back to crossing the sim to real gap. 
The Golem project or the Golem experiment has three stages. In stage one, they're going to evolve a robot to locomote in a physics engine, very much like you've seen before. Little twist here, they're going to evolve not just the, not just the neural controller or the brain, they're going to evolve the body as well. Step two, after evolution has finished uh, in simulation, they're going to take the robot with highest fitness and they're going to send parts of that evolved body to this brand new thing called a 3D printer that's going to manufacture those parts. Step three, all the parts that a 3D printer could not print at that time, like motors and electronics and batteries and sensors and wires uh, and so on, that the human investigators are going to snap in by hand. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of different things going on in the Golem project. One of them is to try and cross the sin to real gap. This is also an attempt to automate not just design of robots, which is what we're doing in this case with the evolutionary algorithm, but they're also trying to automate manufacture of the robots itself. Right? Imagine an integrated software hardware uh, pipeline where you can plug in a fitness function at one end of the pipeline and at the other end of the pipeline you would have a robot that would walk out of the 3D printer, a physical robot that would walk out of the 3D printer that embodies your fitness function. It does what you wanted it to do. People have been working on this now for 23 years. It's not solved yet, but we're getting closer. So there's a contest in our field for the first person that can create a system in which a physical robot walks out of a 3D printer. Yeah. Complete automation of design and manufacture. Not quite there yet. Okay, so here's a little cartoon uh, of what the body of this robot looks like. We have a whole bunch of these rigid, uh, these rigid uh, hollow cylinders made from thermoplastic. That's the white stuff here. So we've got a whole bunch of these hollow cylinders. You'll see these hollow cylinders are connected together uh, with spheres that allow the, the cylinders to rotate relative to one another. It's not uh, very clear in this picture where the motors are. How does this thing start moving? Some of these hollow cylinders are cut in half and they're gonna place a linear actuator inside. They're gonna place a piston inside that can push the two parts of the cylinder apart or pull the two parts back together again. Uh, almost everything we've seen in this course so far has been rotational motorized joints in some way, right? Here we've got rotational joints, but they're passive. But the links between the passive rotational joints, some of them are actuated. They can increase and decrease in length. So far, so good? Okay. Uh, neural network controller, that we're pretty familiar with, uh, neurons and synapses. There are no sensors in this robot. It's completely blind. There is spontaneous activity inside the neurons. So there's something like a central pattern generator generating a sinusoidal pattern that gets fed into the neural network. And that sinusoidal pattern gets transformed by the, by the synaptic weights. And some of the neurons are connected to the pistons, which makes the connected neuron a motor neuron. So the floating point value arriving at this neuron, if that floating point value is positive, it tells the piston to extend. If the value at the motor neuron is negative, that commands the piston to contract. Yeah. Uh, you might remember we referred to this way back as open loop control because we have no sensors. There is no sense, think, act, sense the repercussions of your actions, think, act, sense repercussions, think, act. That's closed loop. When you remove the sensors, you have open loop. You just have a CPG sending signals, and the robot moves in some way depending on its synaptic weights. So far, so good? OK, now we need to create an evolutionary algorithm that can involve 
this body and brain simultaneously. Here's the genotype. Remember the genotype is the blueprint that describes the phenotype, which in this case is the robot's brain and body. The genotype is made up of five different uh, variable length lists. These li the length of these lists can grow and shrink during evolutionary time as the evolutionary algorithm runs. The first, uh, the first list here is actually a list of the other four. So you can really think of this as just basically four lists. The first list contains a list of triplets, which are XYZ coordinates of the vertices that make up the robot. If you have nine triplets, the robot has nine of these vertices sprinkled throughout three-dimensional space. You can now probably imagine the second list contains, uh, in this case, tetrads, sets of four numbers. Each tetrad specifies a link connecting a pair of vertex together. The first two numbers are integers. Which, uh, which link, uh, which pair of vertices is that link connecting? The relaxed length and the stiffness of that link. What does that mean? We've heard this terminology before. Absolutely. What you just described is stiffness, right? How much the link resists uh, extension and compression. Relaxed length, as the name implies, that's the length at which the, uh, the link likes to be. It doesn't like to be longer than this. It doesn't like to be shorter than this. Where have we heard this before? These are springs. So they, it's not shown in this picture. They actually cut all of the cylinders in half, and there's a spring connecting the two halves together. So some of these, uh, some of these cylinders are actually passive and springy, and others are active and springy. You have two cylinder halves cut in half. There's a piston inside, and there's two springs. One spring connecting one side of the piston to one half of the cylinder, the second spring connecting the other side of the piston to the other half of the cylinder. So far so good? Okay. Uh, then, like we saw in the NEAT experiment, the third uh, list uh, is a list of all the neurons. So if we have uh, a list of length 14 here, we have 14 neurons making up the neural network. Um, each, uh, each set of numbers in this list contains the threshold of the activation function for that neuron. And it also contains synapse coefficients to all the other neurons. So in this system, just to make things simple, they just assumed every neuron was connected to every other neuron. So for each of the n neurons, we have one number describing the behavior of that neuron. And and uh, n other numbers, which are the strength of connections to the other n minus 1 neurons, plus the self-connection back to itself. Yeah? OK. The, la the fourth list is the list of actuators. These are the pistons. If this list is length 3, there are three pistons in the robot's body. Each set uh, indicates which bar uh, to embed that piston in. It indicates which neuron should connect to that piston. And finally, the bar range, how much it can extend and compress. Yeah? OK. All right, that's the genotype. You can imagine constructing a genotype at random and then translating it into the phenotype, building the body and brain for that robot. So far, so good? Questions? Yep. How big were these robots when they actually built them? About this big. I'll show you some, some actual videos of the physical robots in a moment. Okay, so we have a population of these, these things, random versions of these things, like we've seen before. In this case, they uh, did something kind of odd, which is they started not with random sets of uh, these uh, lists, they started with null lists. So a null list made up of a null list, null list, null list, null list. So it's kind of an odd decision here. All of the initial robots 
or all of the initial genotypes are null, which produces, by definition, nothing. In the next generation, they, everybody got the same fitness, which was zero, because they had null robots. So by chance, some of those genotypes were killed off. Some of them were randomly copied and then mutated. And as you're going to see, the mutation operators started to add in non-random material to these null genotypes. Okay. They mention in the paper that the evaluation period in simulation for each robot was 12 cycles of its neural controller. What do they mean? What's a cycle of a neural controller? Is that 12 cycles of the CPG? Absolutely. So there's a CPG in here that's going to beat 12 times, and then that's the end. OK. In this case, there were 10 different ways that the evolutionary algorithm could mutate a child genotype that was copied from a parent genotype. You can see the list of 10 different mutation operators here. You'll notice that some of these mutation uh, some of these mutations were more probable than others. We can come back to that in a moment. Every time a parent genotype made a copy of itself to become a child genotype, one mutation was chosen from this list according to these pro uh, probabilities and applied to the newly created genome. Let's do a cartoon example of how this works. What I'm showing you down here is the phenotype, but not the genotype. It, at the beginning, there's nothing. There's no phenotype because there's no genotype yet. It's null. We have a list, a null list of null lists. The little black arrow here represents uh, um, a reproduction event. So a parent producing a child and a mutation occurs. What is the mutation that turned this phenotype into this phenotype? We have a robot that's made up of a single short cylinder or a single short bar. Which mutation among these 10 was applied? Number three, add a dangling bar. Right? That's what we have down here. What's the mutation that was applied when this child produced this grandchild? Change the length of the bar. Exactly. The, length, the bar has gotten longer. <laughs> These robots don't do much. They're just cylinders. Right? There's no movement. Maybe the cylinder rolls in simulation. I don't know. What happened between here and here? What mutation? Number five, add an unconnected neuron. This one to this one. This cartoon is a little unclear because actually there are multiple mutation operators applied between here and here. They say in the paper only one mutation operator. So maybe they're skipping over some children in the lineage here. It's not clear. What mutations transform this phenotype into this phenotype? Bar, the bar gets longer, so number one was applied, change the length of a bar. It's a little unclear here, but we see that there's a new neuron, and our only options here, uh, our only options here is to add an unconnected neuron. There's the unconnected neuron here. The original neuron always tries to connect to any new neurons. It's a detail, it's, sorry, it's not on this slide here. Maybe the details don't matter too much, but you can sort of see through these from the, from the parents of the child to the grandchild to the great-great-great-grandchild and so on. You can see how mutations are gradually elaborating and making evolutionary changes to body and brain simultaneously. Yeah? Uh, I was going to have you write down the actual mutation operators. Let's, let's skip that over in the interest of time. Okay, let's get to the fun stuff. Here's uh, a cut through, partway through, the evolutionary algorithm as it's running. 
So at this point, uh, at this point, obviously we don't have null phenotypes anymore. So evolution has been running for a fair period of time, and in this population, in this population of 200 robots, here's a sample of what they look like. This is from one generation. What can you tell me about what's going on in this evolutionary algorithm at this point? Seems like some of them have similar strategies. Some of them have similar form, and they, so they probably have similar strategies, probably similar ways of moving. But we can see some evolutionary diversity here, right? They're not all identical or near identical. Here's... Uh, uh, th what I showed you was sort of a vertical cut. We're looking at all the evolved creatures at a given point in time. Here's a horizontal cut. We're looking at a lineage where we have the great, 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 great grandparent, the ancestor back here that existed at generation four, which got a fitness of zero. This one didn't actually move at all, but for some reason it got lucky and produced some children. Uh, at generation 13, here's one of its descendants, generation 26, 27. Now this thing is getting a non-zero fitness value, a fitness value of 0.19. It's moved 1.9 body lengths. Its child, or one of its descendants, 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 all the way down to this particular robot that appeared in the population uh, at generation 198. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I misspoke. This is still a horizontal cut. So this one at 198 is still getting a fitness of zero. So this is robot number 109, uh, 198 in the same generation. Sorry, this is not showing evolutionary progress. It is again just showing the sort of diversity in the population but all of these robots, as you can probably guess, are related, genetically related. They have a common ancestor. Yeah? Okay. So nothing too surprising here. We haven't gone to reality yet. Um, what we're looking at now, these are phylogenetic trees. This is yet a, a, new way, a different way to visualize evolutionary progress. This is something you might want to use for your final project. This is a good thing to show because it sort of shows at a glance what's, what happened in your evolutionary run over evolutionary time, which is on the vertical axis here. So generation zero is at the top, and the final generation of the evolutionary run is at the bottom. And horizontal distance is showing, um, uh, is showing actually, is, uh, is showing the similarity of ancestry. So if we take two points at a given depth, and we look at the horizontal distance, the further apart they are horizontally, the further back we have to go to find their common ancestor. The closer together they are, the more recently they had a common ancestor. Yeah. For the purposes of visualization, that's not always true. You can see this particular robot here produced two or three offspring that are placed very far apart from one another. So it's not always true, but generally in this figure, the closer two points are horizontally, the more related they are. If you plot things in that way, you can see lots of interesting macro evolutionary dynamics. Macro meaning obviously at a large scale. Macro evolutionary dynamics. We're not looking at just one robot or a couple robots. We're looking at what's happening in this population as a whole. In uh, this particular evolutionary run, we see a lot of divergence. So at the end of evolution, there are lots of different robots that aren't very well related to one another. Their common ancestor was way, way, way back here. So lots of diversity in the population. Alternatively, in this same, this second run of the same evolutionary algorithm against the same fitness function, you get a completely different result. Now, all of the robots at the end are very closely related brothers and sisters and siblings and cousins. There's a couple of second or third cousins out here, but everyone looks more or less the same and moves more or less the same. Uh, in a third run, they got speciation. They got two distinct sets of robots within both sets, 
Everyone was related and looked and acted more or less the same, but between these two groups, there was a lot of uh, difference. In this fourth run, they got a huge extinction event. So in the first third of the evolutionary run, all of the robots were related to one another and they moved relatively slowly. These dinosaurs uh, were sharing the population with three other robots that weren't related to them. These quote unquote mammals eventually evolved to move faster than these robots over here. So they started producing more offspring and eventually drove all these robots to extinction. And at the end, we still get a lot of related robots. Yeah. I would encourage you to try and create some of these visualizations. Depending on your evolutionary algorithm, there may be a lot of interesting things going on during the evolutionary process that you can't see if you just read the matrix, if you just look at all the fitness values. Yeah? Okay, all right. As promised, we got to the videos here. Let's have a look at two robots from the same population. I don't know if I can play these videos at the same time. Oh, I can, okay. Here we go, uh, two second or third cousins here. You can see their bodies are slightly different and they move slightly differently. Here's uh, from a second evolutionary run, two other related individuals. When this experiment was conducted, physics engines were six months old at this point. Tell me about the physics engines. Tell me about version 1.00001 of physics engines at that time. When we talked about physics engines, I mentioned one of the hardest things to do in physics engines is colli collision detection and resolution to do it well. You can see obviously this physics engine not doing such a great job at collision detection and resolution. I remember reading this paper the year it was published and looking at these videos and thinking, there's no way these things are gonna transfer to reality. However, here we go. Here's the most fit robot from one population, 3D printed, and off we go. In, re in simulation, it traveled 60 centimeters. In reality, it traveled about a third of that. Was there a, a rationale behind like, the choice of material that these robots were placed on? Uh, yes, they are, as you can see, they're placed on carpet with a very high friction coefficient because at that time, it was much easier to simulate surfaces with high friction coefficients. S still true today. Skating and sliding, getting those things to simulate well, not so easy. Yeah, good question. Okay, so they retained basically one third of the evolved behavior. Yeah, doesn't seem like a lot, but hopefully I've impressed upon you right now how difficult the sim to real gap is. This was a huge achievement at the time. Here's another one, creatively named the pusher for obvious reasons. Less than a third of its evolved behavior was retained, but some. The tetrahedron, almost a perfect crossing of the sim to real gap. Three different robots taken from the same experiment that do widely different in how well they cross the sim to real gap. Why? Why does the tetrahedron do such a good job of crossing the gap while the others, not so good? Is it because it's well suited? Possibly. It's a lot simpler. That probably helps. It's probably not all of it. Other things that might be helping the tetrahedron and hurting the other two? It looks like it's not like exploiting the like physics engine as much, where it's like the other ones are kind of like they look like they're moving almost like with like quirks in the engine, just like they're almost like spasming. But this one looks like something that'll work in reality with this like it's stable and like like the way it makes sense looking at like how it's working that it's like 
mirrored in reality, but the other ones are kind of like, if you make them slightly off or like the simulation doesn't work the same way, they just aren't going to work. Absolutely. You can see uh, in the simulation of the arrow, the simulation of the pusher, pusher, there's a lot of things here that aren't physically realistic. There's a lot of object interpenetration, object floor interpenetration. Evolution is, is exploiting the simulator. You can see it, right? What else? There's something else that's helping the tetrahedron here. Less surface area on the carpet, and it's pushing with more of a vertical component. It's pushing more straight down than the other ones are, which is lifting most of the weight of the tetrahedron off the carpet. So it's, it's actually kind of, well, it, it's not clear, but it looks like it's kind of sidestepping a lot of the issues with friction and drag and all the other things that are difficult or impossible to simulate about moving over uh, rough carpet. Yeah. I've been watching this video for 23 years. There's other things also going on here that are just too subtle to see. Yeah? This is part of what makes crossing the sim to real gap so difficult. Yeah? OK. OK, so huge achievement. Um, how, uh, we just saw it crossing the sim to real gap. As I mentioned, they used these brand new things called 3D printers at the time, uh, which used this layer deposition. So this is a greatly sped up video of one of the first 3D printers in action. And you can see it starting to print uh, one of these tubes, one of these uh, hollow cylinders. It's depositing this white uh, thermoplastic that solidifies very shortly after contact. Here you can see a snapshot of it actually building up in layers, uh, the robot. And here's uh, the almost finished product here. Um, at that time, and three, some 3D printers still have this uh, approach, which is they also print the scaffolding material. So these very thin walls of the same thermoplastic to hold up the 3D structure. You can imagine, depending on the 3D structure, some of the parts might be dangling in space, and that's going to make this 2D deposition process difficult. So uh, they would print this out. Uh, they would print this out during the day, and then the evening they would immerse this uh, in a fluid that would overnight gradually eat away thin parts of the thermoplastic, and then they could sort of pull the robot out of this support material in the morning, snap in the motors and sensors, put it on thick carpet, cross fingers and toes, and hope for the best. Okay. Uh, so motor and electronics, it's obviously not completely automated yet. Uh, I mentioned that these bars are attached together with passive rotational joints. Um, one of the nice design innovations this was a nice way to demonstrate the power and the potential of 3D printers at the time, is they can print these complex interconnected 3D geometries, in this case, to allow this cylinder to rotate relative to this cylinder through this vertical plane. Did they simulate resistance in the joints? Did they simulate resistance in the joints? I don't know, and I don't think they mentioned it in the paper, as far as I remember. Yeah, good question, right? And also, what is the resistance in this particular joint? The resistance at one angle is not the same as the resistance at another one. Another candidate for noisification. Yeah. You could imagine uh, evolving this geometry itself. They didn't, but you could, to make this joint range larger, to change the joint normal, to add rotational degrees of freedom, or to make a more complex uh, a more complex relate, rotational relationship between these two parts. Yeah. This was all very exciting at this time. Okay, um, for fun, they put this in uh, a microwave after the fact. Don't do this at home because there's metal parts in here. Remember this is thermoplastic, which has a pretty high melting temperature. So. The hope was, back in 2000, that not only could you automatically manufacture these things, but you might be able, eventually in the far future, to print them with more eco-friendly materials that you could recycle and then possibly reuse. 
We don't quite have this manufacturing technology yet, but maybe someday. Okay. Okay. We have, uh, we're, we have one minute left, so I will just leave these as optional watching. This was a video from the time. They took this idea of 3D printers and actually made Fab at Home. This was an open source 3D printing uh, project. There was one other project at the time going on in the UK called the RepRap. This is a, a 3D printer that can print a 3D printer. Okay. You can go watch that at your leisure. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on your final project. See you next Tuesday.